Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cast Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 859 for February 21st, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. No much regulations there. Like basically, you could do anything about it. Just call it Japanese whiskey and nobody really going to offer to you. This week, Japan's largest whiskey makers agreed on the first ever standards defining just what Japanese whiskey is and what it isn't. While those new standards are voluntary, they're likely to become the benchmark for eventual government regulations. And they'll bring an end to the long-standing practice of importing whiskey from Scotland, Canada, and other countries, then relabeling it as, quote, Japanese whiskey. Makio Masa is the founder of Decanta, one of the largest online retailers specializing in Japanese whiskeys. I'll talk with her about the impact of the new standards later on WhiskeyCast in depth. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, behind the label, and... Outside it was constantly zero and below zero for, for several days. And the fact that we didn't have the sprinkler system in the barrel warehouse freeze and break on us, that was our biggest concern. And so we managed to kind of look out of that one and not, not run into that issue. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like an Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Hey, whiskey fans, I'm Gabriel Cartarella, brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended Scotch whiskey, Dewar's. You could probably guess I've got a lot of stories, but for me, the good ones have one thing in common. They're best told over a glass of whiskey. So hit pause, grab your bottle of Dewar's, and let's get back to this episode of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. Texas is starting to finally thaw out after more than a week of winter storms that caused massive utility outages statewide, with millions of people facing the loss of electricity, natural gas, or water, and in many cases, all of the above. The state's distillers are no exception. Virtually every Texas distillery was affected in one way or another, and the extent of that impact may not be known until this week, as distillers get back into their facilities. In Waco, Balcona's head distiller Jared Hempstead and his team lost an entire week of production. He told me in an email this weekend that they have to wait until their systems thaw out to see how much damage they actually received. In Blanco, Marlene Holmes at Milam and Green Distillery is used to this kind of weather from her days in Kentucky. She told us in an email that the rolling electrical blackouts made it difficult to keep the distillery's boiler going, but that they should be back in operation by midweek. Denison, just outside of Dallas, received eight inches of snow. Iron Root Republic Distillery's Robert Licorice joined us on Friday's Happy Hour webcast. We've been, uh, again, obviously most of the week we are, we didn't have power. So we, between the rolling blackouts that were scheduled and just power outages going down, the distillery uh, in my brother's uh, home actually were completely out uh, of power. Um, so most of the week, my brother um, gathered up his family and he came and spent it down at my house. Uh, I live a little bit farther south than they do and was a little bit more lucky with our electrical uh, situation. So we were able as a family to stay warm, kind of hunker down and kind of cross our fingers that nothing too terrible was happening at the distillery. You got in there yesterday. What did you find? Uh, So we found uh, the barrel room has a lot of garage doors on it. So there's little gaps on the garage door. The garage door comes down. So we had a bunch of snow that had blown into the, uh, into the barrel room. So we had little tiny snow drifts on the inside, which was pretty crazy to see. Again, I wish I had gotten some pictures of it. Uh, but the uh, temperature we had, we do have an insulated barrel our house. So we managed to maintain 
um, we were right around 45 degrees, uh, which, which is cold as it got. So thank goodness, because outside it was honestly zero and below zero for, for several days. And the fact that we didn't have the sprinkler system in the barrel warehouse freeze and break on us, that was our biggest concern. And so we managed to kind of luck out of that one and not, not run into that issue. And you guys aren't the only ones that have had problems like this. It's been re really all over the state. Uh, I saw Heather Green from Milam and Green joking today that uh, they were boiling snow to try to get yeah. drinking water, let alone production water for the distillery. Uh, Marlene's been going crazy down there trying to get keep the distillery going and everything. But what have you heard from your colleagues or have you had a chance to talk to anybody yet? Uh, I have. We actually, um, uh, we were supposed to have a meeting at the Texas Whiskey Association on, on Thursday morning that we ended up canceling just because half the people had power, half didn't. Um, again, most people are, are, are water boilers, as you mentioned, uh, still are. Um, after talking with uh, as many people as I could, and as Daniel Whittington also reached out to most of the distilleries in the state, and everybody seems to have weathered this pretty well. Um, again, people are just starting to really to get back in. But from what everyone could tell, we didn't have any any tanks with alcohol bursting or any issues like that. Um, and again, we as a state, we're a pretty tight knit group. So we do reach out to each other to check on and make sure. And um, even I know locally in Austin, they were calling each other almost every day saying, hey, this is where do we have power? Because different part, different days, different parts of the city would have power. And so I know, I mean, it was, it was pretty crazy even just getting hold of some people because they were having to charge their, uh, their phones in their cars. And that's the only way they had any cell service whatsoever. So we, as an, as a, as a industry in Texas really lucked out with not having any major issues. You had a batch in the fermenters, though, when you had to shut everything down that's been sitting there all week long. Uh, how long do you normally ferment for, and what do you think <laughs> you're going you're to find when you get back in there early next week? Uh, our normal fermentation is five to seven days, which is a little bit, I mean, it's a, a little bit longer than typical. Uh, but I think we're going to find that it's going to be settled out quite a bit, so it's going to take quite a bit to kind of stir that, that, those fermenters up to so we can pump them out. Uh, we did check on the pH and everything on them when we were there yesterday, and they, everything was kind of in order. So it should be interesting to see kind of what type of ester profile we get off of this batch. I imagine it'll be quite a bit different than some of our standard, but again, so that could be really exciting too. So we might end up, uh, if we like it enough, who knows, we might end up having a set that goes two weeks from now on that we keep rolling. So you never know. The biggest delays in restarting production may not be due to power or natural gas, but water supplies. Many distilleries are connected to local water systems. Dozens of cities around Texas are still under mandatory boil orders after water treatment systems failed in the freezing weather. While that might not affect water for use in boilers, the water can't be used for production until state environmental regulators give local water supplies the green light. While I'll have more context on the new standards for Japanese whiskey in a few minutes, it's worth explaining just what those new standards will be. Until now, it's been completely legal to import bulk whiskey from overseas, then label it as a Japanese whiskey, whether it was blended with domestic whiskey or not. The Japan Spirits and Liqueurs Makers Association is putting a stop to that, at least for its members. Starting April 1st, only whiskeys that have been mashed, distilled, and matured for at least three years in Japan can be labeled as Japanese whiskeys, and they also have to be bottled in Japan. The association's members include the two largest Japanese distillers, Suntory and Nika, and both companies will be affected by the new standards, which have a three-year phase-in period for existing products. Suntory confirmed this week that all of its single malts and other whiskies sold outside of Japan already meet the new Japanese whiskey definition, while four of its domestic whiskies will not. That list includes Suntory White, Red, and Taurus, which have some imported whiskey in their blends. 
The domestic version of Kakubin does not meet the new standard, only because some of the whiskey in that blend isn't at least three years old. The export version of Kakubin, sold mainly in other Asian countries, is made with whiskey that does comply with the age requirement. As for Nika, that company has updated its website to confirm that Nika Whiskey from the Barrel, the Nika, Nika Super, and Nika Days do not meet the new standards. Once again, we'll have more on this story with Makio Masa of Decanta later on WhiskeyCast in depth. Last November, in episode 844, we reported that Brown Foreman was looking at plans to expand its flagship distillery campus in West Louisville. This week, Brown Foreman executives confirmed those plans in what will be a $95 million project. It'll be the first major expansion of the Dixie Highway Distillery since 1967, and will double production capacity over the next two years, while the size of the real estate will not change. In addition, there will be a new tree nursery on the campus that will be used to study white oak genetics and growth in urban environments. That nursery will be planted this spring as part of a partnership with the University of Kentucky's forestry program. We got 2020 tourism numbers for the Kentucky Bourbon Trail this past week, and the bad news was not unexpected. Distillery visits were off by 66% from 2019 because of the COVID-19 pandemic, with just 587,307 visitors to the trail's distilleries. That's down from 1.7 million in 2019. Not all distilleries have reopened to tours just yet. Those that have are limited to 50% capacity. Kentucky Distillers Association President Eric Gregory expects the impact to continue well into this year. You know, when you look at it, we welcomed still about 600,000 people safely. And to us, that's uh, that's an achievement in itself, given what everybody went through last year. What do you think 2021 is going to be like, or is it even too soon to even have any hopes about what you might be able to accomplish? Well, you know, we obviously talk a lot to our travel and tourism partners and the Convention of Visitors Bureaus, and um, it appears that consumer confidence is looking up for late fall as more vaccinations get out and people are obviously itching for something to do because they've been, you know, everybody's been kind of hunkered down for uh, almost a year now. So we're hopeful that by the time we get to Bourbon Heritage Month in September and maybe even October, uh, we can start to fully get engaged again with, with our, our tourism community. But at the same time, um, you know, we're, we're just going to have to make sure that everybody gets vaccines and, and see how consumer confidence goes. Um, a lot of events uh, like uh, Bourbon and Beyond, you know, the great concert series in, in September in Louisville, those have all canceled. Um, several things have been pushed back. So we're just going to keep watching it. Gregory and the KDA members face a couple of decisions of their own soon. One, whether this year's Kentucky Bourbon Affair will be able to go ahead as planned in September. Last year's Bourbon Affair was canceled because of the pandemic. Tickets would have to go on sale this spring if they do try to hold the Bourbon Fantasy Camp. There's also a decision coming on whether to hold the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame induction this year, that ceremony is usually held during the Kentucky Bourbon Festival each September in Bardstown, and Gregory says there is no appetite for holding one on Zoom. In other news, Louisville's Peerless Distilling has partnered with nearby Copper and King's Distillery on its latest rye whiskey. It's a cask-strength rye finished in Copper and King's absinthe barrels. It's available only at the distillery in Louisville for $129 a bottle. Scotland's Isle of Skye now has two single malt whiskies. Of course, there is Talisker, but this week the Torabeg Distillery released its first single malt. The Legacy Series 2017 is a four-year-old peated single malt that comes from 100 first-fill ex-bourbon barrels 
It went on sale Friday in the UK to high demand. There's also a first at Ireland's Middleton Distillery. While the 2021 Middleton Berry Rare is the 38th in the series, it's the first edition for new Middleton Master Distiller Kevin O'Gorman. As in previous years, the whiskey itself is a blend of single pot still and grain whiskeys, matured for at least 15 to as long as 36 years. But for his debut release, Kevin used more first fill barrels and increased the grain percentage, as he told reporters during the online launch Thursday. I've worked in maturation for the last, you know, 15, yeah. um, 18 years. And then before that, I was working in, in, in distillation. Um, so I really wanted this particular middle to very rare 21 to reflect both. Um, as I said earlier, I didn't want uh, maturation or too much wood to come to the forefront. I really wanted to get both, best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, and that was my, my, my target this year, and, and that's what I've done. Um, and, you know, every Middleton Rare is a different vintage. Sure. So next year will be a whiskey of its time, and that will be different as well. In past years, the annual release has come in the autumn, but from now on it will be released early in the year, while Middleton Very Rare will still be limited in availability, there are plans to hold back some stock for a second release closer to the holidays. Right now it's available in Ireland and online with a recommended retail price of €180. Euros. That's around $219 U.S. And it'll be available soon in the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, and the U.K. I'll have my tasting notes for it in a few minutes. You may ask once in a while, what's in a name? Well, in the case of the Sassanac, a lawsuit. Outlander star Sam Hewen is appealing a European Union ruling against his bid to trademark the Sassanac name for his Scotch whiskey brand. The Times reports the European Union's Intellectual Property Office sided with Germany's Sasse distillery, which claimed that the Sassenach is too similar to the Sasse trademarks for its whiskies and brandies. That appeal will be heard later this year. The McAllen is teaming up with Sir Peter Blake again. The artist created one of the labels for the legendary 1926 McAllen Fine and Rare Edition that has become one of the world's most expensive whiskies. Now, the Anecdotes of Ages collection features 13 bottles of 1967 McAllen with original labels designed by Blake. Only 12 will be available to collectors, while the 13th original will remain in the McAllen archives. That label will appear on a limited edition release of 322 bottles with the same 1967 McAllen whiskey. The Anecdotes of Ages collection, Down to Work limited edition, will sell for $83,000 a bottle. One of the other 12 original bottles will go on the auction block at Sotheby's next month to raise money for the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum's diversity, and inclusion initiatives. And finally, Friday morning, the 50th and final decanter of the Glen Rothes 50-year-old single malt went on the auction block online. We're all done now at £39,000. I'm going to bring the hammer down. Are we all done? One last look. Going, going, gone. Thank you very much indeed. That is Charles Graham Campbell, the managing director of Bonhams Scotland, bringing down the hammer in Friday's charity auction. As you heard, the winning bid was £39,000, about $54,460 U.S. The winning bidder will get to decide which charity will benefit from that auction. The special decanter comes from Edinburgh's Hamilton and Inches, and was decorated with 22 karat Scottish gold. The winner has not been identified. I have to admit I had a chance to taste the Glenrothes 50-year-old recently. You'll find my tasting notes for it at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long. 
If you missed Friday night's Happy Hour live webcast with Dewar's Master Blender, Stephanie McLeod, and Robert Licorice of Iron Root Republic, the on-demand replay is available right now at the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel. This week I'll be joined by Middleton Master Distiller Kevin O'Gorman and Stuart Buchanan of Ben Riach and Glendronach. As always, we start right at 5 o'clock New York time, 2200 GMT, on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Periscope. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. First off, we have at least one event postponement to report this week. Plans for the Spirit of Toronto Festival May 1st have been put on hold for now because of the pandemic. Organizers are still working with Toronto health officials to see when they may be able to hold it later this year. We'll keep you posted. The online version of this year's whiskey show, Old and Rare, gets underway on Thursday and runs through Saturday. If North Texas is thawed out by this Friday, Bourbon and Bacon is scheduled to take place this Friday night in Dallas. Viewers, Master Blender Stephanie McLeod has an online Scotland Meets Portugal event this coming Saturday with Chef George Mendez, and Men's Journal Magazine has a similar event with the chef and Gabe Cardarella of Dewar's Online, March 3rd. Bonhams has a whiskey auction March 2nd in Edinburgh, Scotland. Bourbon's Bistro in Louisville, Kentucky has a Jefferson's Bourbon Dinner March 11th. Teeling Whiskey Company in Dublin has a virtual St. Patrick's Day Master Class Online March 12th. Turning back to Texas now, the Fredericksburg Whiskey and Wine Fest is March 27th in Fredericksburg, Texas followed by the Galleria Whiskey and Wine Festival in Houston, April 3rd, and the Texas Whiskey Festival at Star Hill Ranch near Austin, April 16th. Finally, the Whiskey Obsession Festival has confirmed its plans to go ahead on April 8th in Tampa, Florida, and the Nth Universal Whiskey Experience has also confirmed its plans for the weekend of April 20th and 21st in Las Vegas, Nevada. Of course, all in-person events remain subject to change on short notice, depending on public health restrictions. So please make sure you check with event organizers before you make any travel plans. We are updating the calendar at WhiskeyCast.com throughout the week as we get updates on event changes. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Gabriel Cartarella again, the doer's guy. I've seen a lot in my years as brand ambassador for the world's most awarded blended scotch. Like the time I got to hold an actual letter written by Andrew Carnegie. A letter from 1891, in it asking doers to ship a keg of whiskey to President Benjamin Harrison at the White House. Spoiler alert, we did. And the bourbon folks were not too happy about it. Pretty cool, right? Well, here's another story for you. In 2019, our master blender, Stephanie McLeod, became the first woman to be awarded Master Blender of the Year by the International Whiskey Competition. And a year after that, she won it again. Stephanie's first creation for Dewar's, Dewar's 15 year, is another piece of history. Sweet, floral, with notes of honey and toffee, a perfectly balanced addition to the Dewar's lineup. It's a great introduction to scotch for beginners, and it's more than complex enough to satisfy whiskey aficionados. So grab some Dewar's 15, call some friends, and make a few stories of your own. That's what a good bottle of whiskey is all about. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by the Distiller's Edition Collection. It's been almost a year since we discussed the lack of regulations for Japanese whiskey with Japan-based whiskey blogger Liam McNulty in episode 815 of WhiskeyCast. This week, the Japan Spirits and Liqueurs Makers Association unveiled new industry standards for what its members will define as Japanese whiskey 
as of April 1st. And as I mentioned during the news, a whiskey will have to be mashed, distilled, matured, and bottled in Japan in order to be labeled as Japanese whiskey. Nika Whiskey has already updated its website to reflect that four of its whiskeys will not meet that standard, including the award-winning Nika Whiskey from the Barrel. Even though whiskeys currently on the market will have three years to come into compliance. For some context into this change, I talked with Makio Masa. She's the founder of Decanta, one of the largest online retailers that specializes in Japanese whiskeys. She joined me on an occasionally noisy Zoom connection from her home base in Barcelona, Spain. Makio, let's explain the、uh, basis for these new regulations、mm-hmm. uh, because there really hasn't been any standard. For Japanese whiskeys until this point, right? Yes, yes. Which means that、uh, basically anybody could do anything, right? Yeah, I say, let's say it that way, yeah. So f- until this came out, yeah, haven't been much regulated there for Japanese whiskey. What were the whiskey makers doing that prompted all this and that was causing problems? I know that you at Decanta had been arguing for some sort of regulation for a long time now. Yeah, I mean,、uh, just as my personal experience, I've been travel around the world, and、uh, as a Japanese whiskey lovers, and、uh, one of the few first people start the with Japanese whiskey industry like evolve. Sometimes I could feel a little bit of fun while travel to, for example, countries. And I, if I went to a shop, I saw a Japanese whiskey. The label says Japanese whiskey, which I never heard in Japan. And、uh, when if you try to reach out to the producer or go to Google, you can hardly find any information, anything to do with Japan. But it's Japanese whiskey. That's、uh, really how the situation was. Really, no much regulations there. Like basically, you could do. Anything about it? Just call it Japanese whiskey, and nobody really gonna offer to you. And it was so bad that basically all you had to do was bring a tanker from any place into Japan, and once it hit Japanese soil, it could be called Japanese whiskey, right? Yeah, and、uh, I, I sometimes I do wonder myself if、uh, actually those、uh, some of the whiskeys could. Japanese whiskey. If they actually all of them are bottled in Japan, I do believe there could be some bottles actually not even bottled inside Japan. I mean, not bottled like the bottle is, but like made true distilled di- di- in Japan, like uh, just uh, basically just print a label called Japanese whiskey. Does this satisfy all your concerns about?、Uh... Where the market was heading in terms of、uh, increasing transparency and actually proving that these whiskies are made in Japan. Yes, I mean definitely it's a、uh, it's a、uh, help improving the Japanese whiskey quality. Let's say it, it, at least the water has to be from Japan. It has to be distilled and natural inside Japan in order to to call it Japanese whiskey. I do think it's a very big,、uh, a positive change for the Japanese whiskey industry and Japanese whiskey lovers. What do you think is going to happen to some of the whiskies that will not meet this new standard? There are some very popular ones like、uh, Nika from the Barrel that they have acknowledged will not meet the new standards now.、Um, yes, it, they just cannot call it Japanese、uh, whiskey anymore, but they can still Japanese whiskey if it's blended with Japanese whiskey. So it doesn't mean it's bad whiskey. It, it just cannot be called Japanese whiskey anymore. So I don't think it's a bad thing. It will be still space there for whiskey lovers to try to find out. You know, it's just、uh, cannot call Japanese cannot label as the, what it was before. But I do not think it, it means that it's bad whiskey. It's a whiskey like I drink, but it still would be great. Some great liquid out there, yeah, for people to enjoy. Are you pleased with the、uh, the way the industry in Japan has explained these new rules and、uh, what appears to be overwhelming support? I know there are some whiskey makers there who are not members of the、uh, Spirits and Liqueur Makers Association, and theoretically, this standard won't apply to them. But are you pleased with the way the industry has tried to?、Uh, Straighten this problem out. 
Yes, I do. I mean, as you can see, my smile on my face. I, I am very happy for that. Very pleased that this happened, uh, because uh, years ago I was uh, expecting this to happen. So this is not any surprise to me. This happened, and uh, I'm very happy about it. Yeah, very pleased. Do you think we're still going to see some companies try to get around this who are not members of this association? Yes, I do believe there will be still like people whiskey producer to try because maybe they have a passion about Japanese whiskeys and maybe they still want to do something about it. But I just don't think、uh, there will be the amount of the people try to do that will be a significant job. That's for sure. Do you think the government will eventually take these regulations and give them the force of law? And why didn't the government step in sooner on this? Ah,、uh, yeah, it's good question. I asked myself、uh, as well before, like why this didn't happen there before. I was taking so long, but I guess it's hard to answer on my position why this didn't happen. But I think the main thing is because、uh, Japanese whiskey industry is still very young. It's only really getting popular in in last ten and twelve years. So it really takes. Hi, for people really pay attention what is really happening. So now it's because there's so many small distillery opening inside Japan. So I do believe like、uh, more and more companies involved, the government notice, and uh, uh, also the some bigger companies behind is forcing this to happen. How is this going to change the way you market whiskeys at Decanta? How are you going to change your website to explain? The whiskies that you've been selling that don't meet the new standards, or are you going to just drop those whiskies? No, I wouldn't say we are just going to drop it. We will just、uh, have a cutlet to say it is a whiskey. We are not very.、Uh, we are on.、Um, it's not a whiskey like a, it's it's a Japanese whiskey or it's a Japanese blend. We will just、uh, have a label for for it to say it is.、Uh, We we cannot really、uh, we are not very sure whether this is where this whiskey is made, because as a decanter, one of the biggest online retail whiskeys,、uh, we will always be as much as transparent to our、uh, customers and honest about what we we provide to our、uh, customers. But sometimes it's very difficult with、uh, the producer, whiskey producer, to really. Gave us all the informations. Some of them just,、uh, yeah, I think, have their own concerns. So we will always be as much as transparent as we could. Yeah. By the way, Macchio and her team sent an update later to clarify their plans for selling whiskies that don't conform to the new standards, whiskies that are known to contain both Japanese whiskey and imported whiskey, will be listed on the Decanta website as quote. World blends. Any whiskey produced in Japan that does not comply with the new standard will be listed as quote unspecified origin. That is whiskey cast in depth, brought to you by the Distillers Edition collection lineup of single malts from Diageo's Classic Malts. Look for the new 2020 editions of Oban, Talisker, Lagavulin, Craigenmore, Dalwini, and Glenkinchy at a whiskey shop near you, and get all the details at malts.com. The what I'm tasting this week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with one of Nika's recent releases that does conform to the new Japanese whiskey standards. The Yoichi single malt that is finished in apple brandy barrels. It's bottled at 47% ABV. The nose has notes of apple pie, oak, soft spices, and a hint of toffee. The taste has spicy notes of clove and allspice, complemented by honey, caramel, and red apples. The finish has lingering spices, balanced by a fruity tartness. I'm scoring the Yoichi Apple Brandy finish a 91. I received a sample of the 2021 Middleton Very Rare in time for this Thursday's online launch event. As always, it's bottled at 40% ABV. The nose has notes of dried flowers, butterscotch, sandalwood, vanilla, tree fruits, and brown sugar. 
The taste starts off with a ginger and lemon zest tartness, along with dried flowers, honey, subtle spices, brown sugar, and just a hint of oak. The finish is long and well-balanced, with a lingering tartness and hints of vanilla and caramel candy. It's excellent. I'm scoring the 2021 Middleton Very Rare Irish Whiskey a 94. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Want to find out how Sagamore Spirit is reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye whiskey? In-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences at the Sagamore Spirit website. They're offering WhiskeyCast listeners a free virtual guided tasting. If you buy a bottle from your local retailer, a Sagamore Spirit teammate will guide you through each product. Visit sagamorespirit.com and use the code WhiskeyCast, all one word, to access. Please drink responsibly. Now, let's look at a couple of recently released 25-year-old single malts. Bell Blair's 25-year-old is bottled at 46% ABV. It was first matured in ex-bourbon barrels before being finished in Spanish oak. The nose has fruity notes of peaches, pears, and apricots, along with hints of butterscotch, vanilla, and caramel. The taste is dry and spicy with oak tannins, hints of cedar and sandalwood, a touch of clove, and black tea with honey. The finish is long and dry with lingering spices and a nice oakiness. I'm scoring the Bal Blair 25-year-old a 92. Meanwhile, Ben Rioch's new 25-year-old is a four-cask blend of bourbon, sherry, virgin oak, and Madeira wine casks. It's also bottled at 46% ABV. The nose is aromatic with black cherries, apricots, dark chocolate, toffee, and a subtle oakiness. The taste is complex with baking spices, apple cobbler, a hint of orange peel, and toasted caramel. The finish... It's long with a kiss of smoke and a touch of toasted caramel. I'm scoring the Ben Rioc 25-year-old a 93. The one I'm tasting this week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these whiskeys to our searchable list of nearly 3,100 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. Check it out this week. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Robin Redbreast, you may have seen me around. Face label, label face, yeah, that's the one. I'm now contractually obligated to be their spokesbird. <laughs> yeah, my agent didn't read the small print. Proud sponsor of Whiskeycast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. Had a lot of comments on the Japanese whiskey standards after the announcement this week and our story at whiskeycast.com. Here are just a few. Mark Brown at Shadowman1977 on Instagram said, About time. Time for all Japanese whiskey to actually be Japanese whiskey. Christos Koulizakis at Whiskey Ambassador added this on Instagram from London. It's a start. Now we need formal legislation, too. At Dram Voyager on Twitter responded with this. Great move and start on regulations. I am still going to enjoy my Nika from the barrel. If there's something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's wrap up the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. And it's time once again to talk about the T word in whiskey, terroir. 
that sense of place that influences the flavor of wine and whiskey, along with a lot of debate about whether it actually exists in whiskey. Ireland's Waterford Distillery has been arguing in favor of terroir's effect on whiskey ever since it opened at the end of 2015, and has been backing scientific research to prove the impact of terroir on the flavor of barley. Oregon State University's Dr. Dustin Erb is the lead author on a peer-reviewed paper published this past week in the scientific journal Foods. The study examined barley samples from two of the 40 Irish farms growing barley for Waterford in 2017 and 2018. After the barley was malted and distilled in the lab, the new make spirit samples were examined using gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and olfactometry tools. The researchers found flavor compounds consistently influenced by the specific conditions in the soil at each farm, and argue that that proves terroir does have an impact on whiskey. There are plans for a follow-up paper next year doing similar analysis on Waterford's mature whiskey. Now, I posed a couple of questions about the study this weekend on Twitter, playing devil's advocate, that brought a lot of negative reaction from the Waterford folks, specifically CEO Mark Rainier. I'm not discounting the research, and if any distillery can prove the impact of terroir, it is likely to be Waterford, since it malts, distills, and matures barley from 40 different farms separately each year. That is the only way one is going to be able to prove terroir exists in whiskey, since almost all distilleries use bulk supplies of malted barley from any number of farms, and the small grain-to-glass distilleries often rely on just a single farm, which makes it hard to look at the differences between farms. My objection to Waterford's declaring the terroir question settled now is that this study used barley samples from consecutive years. One of the things I tweeted is that I'd like to see this study done in the future with, oh, say, three samples five years apart from the same fields. That way, it would really be possible to see whether a specific farm influences the flavors in its barley over a longer period of time. Now, Mark Rainier called my suggestion, quote, illogical on Twitter, and he is certainly entitled to that opinion. As I said before, I am not discounting the research that's been done so far. I just want to see more data over a longer period of time before declaring the question of terroir in whiskey solved. But this is a really good start. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. A rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist. A unique, triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com, along with the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes. I love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. At Doers, we love a good story, and that's why we're always writing new chapters. Like our Ely Gal Smooth finished in Mezcal casts, with notes of sliced green pepper and a wisp of smoke, a world's first Ely Gal brings cultures together for something truly unique. As a 174-year-old brand, we could rest on our laurels. Instead, we'd much rather continue writing. Because when you keep telling the same old story, that's when people stop listening. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever go out drinking with a peacock? <laughs> Always the same. Few too many, tail feathers come out.
drinks get knocked over, bartender's not happy, night's over before it started. All I'm saying is, don't be the peacock in your group. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.